This video will cover mutual funds. It's the first video in a series of two. And I label this background. It'll give you background material to mutual funds. The second video will give you background. The second video will provide you examples of the various types of mutual funds that are out there in the world. So this video will introduce investment companies which are better known as funds. People just simply refer to them as funds. It's easier to, easier to say. We'll discuss the motivation for funds. We'll discuss and compute net asset value, which is the, the equity per share of a fund. We'll discuss and compute offering prices, which is the price you'll have to pay to buy into a fund. Sometimes the net asset value and the offering price are different because of loads. And we'll talk about loads, which are front-end fees to get into a fund. We'll discuss expenses, fees, fee structures, and share classes in this video. An investment company or a fund is basically a type of financial company that pools money from investors to purchase assets such as stocks, bonds, and money market instruments. Now you're used to seeing financial institutions pooling money. I mean, that's exactly what a bank does. A bank pools its money. It makes loans with your money. It also buys treasury securities and other securities and other assets with the money that, they're ba that you're basically funding them with. And then they give you a return for it in some cases. In some cases, they give you services like checking. Now, with an investment company, you become an equity owner. So uh, you become an equity owner in the investment company. When you deposit money in a bank, you're not an owner unless you're looking at a at a credit union type uh, business, and I'm not talking about credit union. If you put money into a bank, you deposit money there, it's a liability to the bank, it's an asset for you, and they use that liability, that money, to fund their, their loans and their investments. But with an investment company, a fund, they have assets, they have liabilities, and they have equity. And so people like you and I invest in these funds like you know we we don't want to manage we may not want to manage your money we may not have a background in managing money and there's a lot of a lot of work going on to manage a, a well diversified big portfolio so what we do is you and i send our money in let's say we send in a thousand dollars and we send it into an investment company that maybe they're maybe they specialize in value stocks so somehow they, they have a, a method of figuring out what are cheap stocks, you know, because that's when you want to buy stocks when they're I mean, low prices and that they're, they're going to appreciate in value. So they're, they're cheap at this moment. So you give $1,000 and you get shares for that, right? And so you're going to give the company $1,000 in cash. Now, obviously, they're not going to sit on that cash. They're going to turn that cash into stocks and they're going to have a portfolio of stocks that just goes on in fact you know if it's a fund that mimics the s&p 500 you're talking 500 stocks going down this side so there's lots and lots of stocks in the portfolio it could be bonds with hundreds of bonds and money markets with hundreds hundreds of money market securities so the point is we are the equity holders and then we we are basically investing portion of our money in in these stocks so now if this whole entire fund if this entire fund was worth a million dollars it's worth a million dollars then we would be as as you and i if we put in a thousand dollars and we got shares for that we would have 0.1 percent in value of that portfolio we would own 0.1 percent of the assets we would have uh, we would have obligations of 0.1 percent of these liabilities, and we'd be a 0.1 percent equity owner of this one million dollar fund. So we own a proportional share of the fund, is what I'm trying to say. We can't get very far into studying investment companies and funds without understanding how do you determine the price of these shares that we bought? We bought a thousand dollars worth of shares. We don't know how many shares. Didn't tell you because I don't know the price here. So how do you think you calculate that? Well, it's calculated in a formula called net asset value per share. And the net asset value per share is market value of the assets 
minus loans divided by the number of shares outstanding in the fund. So let's look at this formula, net asset value per share. Well, assets minus liabilities is equity. This is the equity in, in million, in, in you know thousands and millions of dollars. That's what the equity is, right? Here. And then you divide it by the number of shares outstanding in the fund, and you get a net asset value per share. And that's the price you're going to pay when you buy into a mutual fund. For, for now, for the time being, you buy into a mutual fund, the price you pay is the net asset value. That's what's going to get invested. Pretty soon, we're going to look at some funds charge loads or front-end fees, and we're going to have to pay a little bit more than the net asset value, a price called offering price. But let's hold off on that concept a little bit. Just focus on net asset value because this is the key to understanding how much it costs to get into a fund. So let's do an example. Let's, let's get away from this example. And let's do another example of calculating an NAV. So here's the problem. It says XYZ Mutual Fund has assets with a current market value of $10 billion, dividends and redemptions payable of a half a billion, and a billion shares outstanding. What is the NAV? Okay. Well, you don't have to do this. You can put together a balance sheet. Look, this is 10, this is 0.5, so this has to be 9.5. But right now, everything's in billions. And so we need to translate that into NAV per share. This is the net asset value for the entire company. So in, in the example here, 10 minus 0.5, Divide it by one billion shares, so there's a billion, nine billion, nine and a half billion dollars, and there's a billion shares underneath it there that composes that nine and a half billion dollars, and so it comes out to be the net asset value per share is nine dollars and fifty cents per share. Let's look at another question, and the question has to do with okay, you buy these things; they're a little weird, but What's the total return on them? So that's the next question. And the point that I'm going to make here is, look, if you treat the net asset value as if it's like a stock price, like we have in the past, then it's going to be pretty easy to calculate the total return of a mutual fund. So here's the example. Let's continue with the notes here. It says Alpine Value Stock Portfolio Mutual Fund specializes in buying undervalued stocks based on low P.E., and high price to book. So we'll talk about price earnings ratios and price to book and book to price ratios as methods to find undervalued stocks. So well, that, that'll pop up in a, in a later lecture. For now, we just assume, look, this is a mutual fund that's trying to outperform the market buying value stocks. And the net asset value per share at the beginning of the year was $19.02. And at the end of the year, it was $20.16. The fund paid a $2.25 dividend for the year. What was the total return and the components, dividend yield and capital gains yield, on this fund? Well, the total return is going to equal this. You ended up with $20.16 for a net asset value, and you paid $19.02. Right, so there's your capital gain, that difference right there, which is a buck fourteen divided by nineteen oh two, and this is 0 0.06. So you got six percent capital gain for your total return. Plus you got two twenty-five divided by nineteen oh two. This is the dividend yield, and this comes out to be 0.118. So your total return is seventeen point eight percent. So that's really not bad. So once you wrap your head around the fact that, look, you get a net asset value, and in a lot of cases, that's what you're going to pay. It hopefully appreciates, pays some dividends, and you get your total return. So now what we want to do is let's move on to the motivation for investment companies. Now we want to ask ourselves, why are there so many mutual funds out there? There are literally... Tens, uh, probably 10,000 mutual funds and ETFs, and ETFs are in this category of funds, it was, as we'll, you'll see in the next video, video two, on mutual funds. But there's literally trillions of dollars tied up, literally trillions tied up in investment companies and funds. 
And so there's a lot being offered. There's a huge supply and there's a huge demand. So why, why is that? Well, let's take a look at the, the economic reasons, justification for why investors want to buy into these funds. The first category, the first reason is economies of scale. And you remember economies of scale from economics. It said, look, as your plant size gets bigger and bigger and bigger, your costs come down. And that's what happens here. So here we have the size of the fund. When I say the size of the fund, I'm generally talking about the dollar amount. You know, is this millions and billions? And you get the further out you go here, the larger it gets. And then here, what I'm talking about is the cost side. It's the, oops, it's the cost per dollar invested. So what are the costs per dollar invested? So the graph looks like this, and this is a graph that you would see in your economics book. It says, look, when your plant size, usually discussed as a manufacturing firm in, in, in microeconomics, when it's small, you have pretty high costs. But you know, you start to spread your costs out over a lot of different assets, right? And you get bigger and bigger, and you start to spread your costs, your fixed costs out. And not only that, but you can have people that specialize in various categories, and they get really good at what they're doing. So your costs come down. But eventually, things ramp up, as you might recall from your microeconomics course. Though microeconomics is not required for this course, but let me fill you in anyway. This cost curve can go up because firms get too big eventually. They get too big, unwieldy, hard to manage, and their costs start to ramp up. So this is, that accounts for this upward movement. So now the question is, well, where are we in today's world with investment companies? What is the cost per dollar invested? Where is the minimum? Well, it turns out to be less than less than, and this is the high level, 0.10% of your investment. That is really, really low. That translates into look, 0.001 times a dollar. That's 0.001. That's basically a tenth of a cent is what it could cost you per year for these funds. Now, certain funds not all funds, I should say, are down here at this point. And it tends to be the funds that are down here, these are the funds that index. They're matching the S&P 500. They're trying to match the Dow. It doesn't take any active management to do that. There's no giant portfolio management department trying to, to scour their, scouring the world for securities to buy. You don't have any of those costs. You, have, you do have somebody looking over the portfolio, but it's basically done on a computer because... It's a buy and hold. You're just matching the S&P or the Dow. So your costs are really low. Now, uh, some funds look like this. This sweet spot here, this sweet spot is much higher. And the reason for that is they're actively managed. So if they're an actively managed portfolio, well, they're going to have expenses, you know, conceptually all along here, they're going to be higher. But they will get economies of scale from size and so, but they'll have higher expenses. Higher expenses could be, you know, um, 1.25 down to 0.10%. Now, anything much higher than 0.5%, half a percent, in other words, is just too much. So you, you really have to have a good reason to buy into a fund that has an expense ratio higher than a half a percent, at least in my mind. You, they really have to be showing you that they're getting really good returns. And the important thing to remember is there's a ton of literature and studies out there that show that just because you have higher expenses doesn't mean you have a better return. In fact, it's the other way around. The higher your expenses, the less your returns are because it's... Remember, your returns to a mutual fund are the returns that are generated from the portfolio minus the expenses. And if your expenses are really high, then the returns that investors get are going to be low. So expenses matter, really matter with investment companies. Now, another reason, an important reason for mutual funds in their existence is diversification benefits. 
And here we have the number of assets on this axis. And here we have risk. So you remember from, from basic financial management, you remember you had risk that comes down and comes down and comes down. As you add more and more securities to your portfolio, there's diversification effects. And eventually you come down to this point where all you have is what's called systemic risk, systematic risk that you can't get rid of, market risk, in other words. That's this part right here, market risk. You can't get rid of that because even if you hold 10,000 securities in your way out here, you still have risks. And what are those risks associated with? Macroeconomics. You know, it's, it's the thing the Fed is worried about. It's the economy. It's the budget. It's, you know, deficits, unemployment, and so on. That's what drives this market or systemic risk. Right here, this area here is idiosyncratic company specific risk that tends to net out as you add securities to your portfolio. So you have a portfolio of one security, you've got a lot of risk. But as you add and diversify randomly, that's important, you randomly pick securities and put them in your portfolio, your risk comes down, but it doesn't come down to zero. That should look familiar. We often call that the sliding board graph because you slide down with the benefits of diversification. Now, the third reason to invest in mutual funds, which is really good reason, is that there's professional management. You got professional portfolio managers making buy and sell decisions if they're actively managing it. The fund will keep track of uh, all the bookkeeping. They'll keep track of taxes for you. They'll track risk and give you all sorts of analysis on the portfolio. And they manage to buy thousands, in some cases, thousands of stocks and hundreds of bonds, depending on the type of portfolio. So you get a lot of diversification. And it would be nearly impossible for you to keep track of that on your own. If you manage stock track portfolio in, in this class and you're managing like 10 or 15 different stocks, imagine what it would be like if you managed a you know, 500? Hmm. Okay, now let's move on. Let's move on to fees and expenses. These, this is an important area. So there's a lot of portfolios out there, a lot of funds that charge what's called a front-end load. It's a sales charge. It's front-end load because you pay it when you first enter into the fund. And every time you put money into the fund, they're going to skim a little bit off and it just goes to pay for some of their expenses associated with having brokers and financial planners and maybe even employees of insurance companies to help and guide you as to what, what funds to buy. Because when you go and you buy a fund, if you're getting assistance, they're gonna be asking you all sorts of questions about your risk tolerance, your age, when do you expect to retire, and so on. So it's important that that you recognize that there can be front-end loads. Not all the time. Not all funds have front-end loads. In fact, the good ones don't. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but let me, let me get through what exactly a load represents. So a load is a sales charge. It's a usually 2-3%. It could be up to 5.75% is the maximum. And it gets added to the net asset value. And I say added, I put it that in quotation marks. This is how it's calculated. Offering price. That equals the net asset value per share divided by one minus the load in decimal form. Okay, that's the general formula. And it's basically the net asset value we calculated before. Okay, so it's really skimming off of this load from the offering price. So if you cross multiply and set them equal, you can see it's offering price times one minus the load equals the NAV per share. So you pay this. This is what you're going to pay. They're going to skim this percentage off. right? This, this percent is what's going to be skimmed. What's here is what's left. So this, this will be in the example I'm going to show you. This is 97%. So you pay $100. You only get 97% invested, $97. 3% goes bye-bye. They keep it. Now, let's do an example. Go back to the XYZ company. Remember XYZ fund? It had a net asset value of 950. Maybe we calculated that earlier. What would be the offering price? 
Well, the offering price here would be 950 divided by 1 minus 0.03 is $9.79, which means 21 cents goes goes bye bye. It's gone to the fund sponsor. It'll go back to the brokers, the insurance companies that helped you set this up. But also be careful. I'm telling you, that it goes to brokers and investment firms um, and, and insurance company people that help you. But sometimes funds will charge you loads even if they don't provide you any services, which is crazy. Why would you want to pay a front end load for services that you don't get? And then only, you know, what's remaining is, is in this case, 97% is what actually gets invested in your portfolio. The rest of the 3% is gone. There are lots of studies that show, even by the companies that manage mutual funds, show that funds that have high-end loads perform no better than the no-load funds. So those funds are called no-loads. It means they have no front-end loads. Now, there's another type of load that's important. So I just showed you a front-end load. There are things called a back-end load. And sometimes they're called deferred contingent sales charges. Deferred contingent sales charge. Whew. Now, what the heck does that mean? Well, deferred means you may be subject to this after a while, after a period of time, some later point in time. And that's what the contingent's also telling you. It's contingent. It may or may not happen. And then it's a sales charge. So here's how it works. Basically, if you want to leave the fund and exit the fund, some funds will charge you a back-end load or what's called a deferred contingent sales charge. And what it is is it's a charge so that basically they skim, you know how they basically skim some money off the top of what you sent in here, right? They skim 3% off in this calculation. Well, they're going to do the same thing here. They're going to skim whatever, whatever investment you have. If you have $100 that you want to withdraw, well, if there's a 3% back-end load, you're only going to get going to get $97 back. Many funds, even the good funds, charge back-end loads. And the reason for it works like this. There's a lot of investors who like to trade investment companies if they can. They'll dart in and out of the fund. They'll buy a dollar amount one day, sell it the next, buy and sell, buy and sell. Well, when that happens, it disrupts the portfolio manager because the portfolio manager is continuously having to sell a, por a portion of their portfolio for the proceeds. And then when they get the proceeds the next day back from the investor, they got to find stocks to buy. So it's very disruptive and costly. So what the funds do, even the good ones, will charge you a back-end load, and that will prevent people from darting in and out of funds. Now, the, the, it's usually on a declining scale. So it could be, it could be a 4% load sell a uh, back end load for the first year and then if this if you hold it for two years it maybe it's three percent and in the third year period it could be two percent and then in the fourth year period it could be one percent and then after that it could drop to zero something like that it's called a sliding scale there are also um, other reoccurring fees you could have account fees maintenance fees that are associated with with uh, a mutual fund investment so keep that in mind the other important area is called management fees which are reoccurring but so by the way account maintenance fees can be reoccurring and they can be non-reoccurring now let's go to management fees back to that management fees you know somebody has to manage the fund somebody has to have all the offices and arrange for the coordination of lawyers accountants professional portfolio managers uh, computer people, grounds and maintenance, the whole nine yards. And so that's what a company like Vanguard and Fidelity does. They manage that. And so it costs money to manage the whole complex. In fact, if you go down to v Vanguard home base in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, it's literally called a campus. A campus. It has lots and lots of huge buildings with a lot of activity going on. It doesn't come free. So there's management fees associated with funds. There's also investment advisory fees, which are paid to portfolio managers. Sometimes a company like Vanguard or these other mutual fund companies, they won't actually manage the, the fund in-house. 
they'll have a portfolio manager external to the fund manage it. So there's investment advisory fees associated with it. They're going to need banks to hold on to the securities and to collect the cash and manage the cash accounts, collect dividends and so on. So those would be custodian fees, trustee fees. There's audit and legal fees. I used to audit mutual funds years ago. So we used to charge a fee uh, for, for checking to make sure that you know, the income statement and the balance sheet statement that they they tell investors or, you know, this is how much money we made, this is how much we have in assets. Well, I used to go back and check that. Is the portfolio really there that they claiming? Did they really make $2 million in that interest income? Well, that's, that's what an auditor does. And then you have legal fees for registration fees and attorney's fees associated with it. You also have shareholder servicing fees. And, you know, think about it. In a lot of mutual fund companies, you've got people manning telephones for people calling in and they don't know how to redeem their shares. They don't know what to buy. They need advice. They need help. And there could be a really large department devoted just to that. And so those are called shareholder servicing fees because they're servicing shareholders. You know, they, they actually keep track of the accounts that shareholders have. There's also shareholder report expenses. So you get a shareholder report. It's all nice, glossy, and pretty. It costs a lot of money. It usually costs the hundreds of thousands just to produce and print those things. In some cases, over a million dollars. There's also a fee called 12B1 fees. Some funds charge 12B1 fees. And that's, it sounds kind of weird, but it, it's named after a section in the Investment Company Act in 1940. So why am I talking about that? Well, mutual funds and investment companies are overseen by the Securities and Exchange Commission. And many of the rules that guide how investment companies operate and how they're defined is under the Investment Company Act of 1940. And in a section called 12B1 of the Investment Company Act of 1940, it tells you how much an investment company can charge in terms of certain fees for distribution and advertising and marketing. They're called 12B1 fees. This was a very controversial issue years ago. And the controversy was, was this. If I'm a shareholder, why would I want to pay for advertising and marketing expenses to draw in new investors? I'm just a shareholder. I just want a good return. I want you, the investment company, to invest in good assets, deduct the expenses that really counted that took to, to buy those, those stocks and the, or those bonds. I don't want to pay for advertising expenses. That benefits the investment company. You can see that that was kind of controversial. Investment funds fought back and said, wait a second, you know, if we get more customers in the door and you guys may be paying for it as investors, but, you know, we get economies of scale, the bigger the fund. And the bigger the fund, the lower the cost. So even though you're paying now for these expenses, your costs are going to be lower if the fund gets bigger. And the problem is there's no guarantee that those funds are going to get bigger. And there's no guarantee that you're going to get economies of scale. It could be. It could, how do you know that you're not here and the company's advertising and actually going to drive up the costs? So you see that. It, it's assuming, the funds were assuming that they're out here and if they increase the fund's size through marketing and advertising, the costs will come down. And so, well, you may have paid for it in terms of distribution and marketing fees and advertising fees, but your costs ultimately are lower. The whole thing came to a head in 1980, and now the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, FINRA, caps 12B1 fees. And so that's how things have worked for quite a long time now. The important thing to remember with 12B1 fees is that they're recurring fees. They happen every year. Those loads that we looked at, the front end, back load, end loads, they only happened once. The front end load only happens once, and the back end only happens once for each transaction. But with 12B1 fees, you get dinged every year for the amount of the fee. In fact, every single day, they, they skim just a little bit off because they compute a net asset value every day, which means they have to account for their expenses every day. Some, some funds now 
nowadays call these 12B1 fees level loads. So they're basically acting like a load, but they're reoccurring and they're level, meaning they happen all the time at the same percent. Could be three quarters of a percent, 0.75 percent, up to one percent, as I said before. So my point is here is be careful of those 12B1 fees. You should not be paying 12B1 fees. And if you pay 1% per, per year for 30 years, as you have your money tied up in a fund for retirement, they're just going to eat you alive. You're not going to have much of a balance left. I mean, you'll have some, but you, you would have wasted a lot of money paying 12B1 fees. So there's no reason to pay 12B1 fees. You can find lots of funds that don't charge them. Now, there's trading costs, obviously. If you're buying and selling securities, it's actively managed. It's going to have trading costs. Even if it's not actively managed and it's passively managed, trying to track like the S&P 500, they're still making buys and sells decisions. I mean, they're not decisions, but they're just buying and selling securities because people are adding more money to the fund and people are withdrawing money from the fund. There's going to be some transactions going on. And so there'll be some fees associated with that. Now, when you have transactions costs, I'm talking like a commission. In stock tracking, you usually get a $10 commission per trade. And so where does that commission go? Well, what it does is it, it adds to the cost of the stock. For example, if you're buying a stock, it adds to the cost. And when you sell and you get a $10 commission, it, it reduces the proceeds. So what happens is you never see it on an income statement. And you don't really get an income statement with, with stock track. But... You, even if you produced your own income statement, you wouldn't see it because your proceeds are reduced by the $10 and your costs are increased by the $10. You don't see a specific line item that says commissions. It could be in a footnote if you look at a real annual report to, a, to an investment company. But here's, my, here's the point here. Funds have turnover, and the higher the turnover, the higher the costs. Even though you can't actually see it in an income statement, you're still paying them. And so if you know what the turnover rate is, which will be discussed in the footnotes to the financial statements of the investment company, then you'll have uh, an idea of how much is going on and how much your, your trading costs would be. And then sometimes if you look really hard, you'll find the trading costs in a footnote. But let's look at turnover. So the concept of turnover is important. The definition of turnover for investment companies is the lesser of annual purchases or sales of the securities divided by the net asset value. So it's the lesser of annual, so it's computed on an annual basis, purchases or sales divided by average NAV. So usually when these calculations, when we do ratios with investment companies, you don't use the NAV, the net asset value, at the end of the period. It's usually the average for a period of time. You know, because things go crazy at December 31st or if it's June 30th, whatever the end period end is ending in, that last day could be a little crazy, which means... The, the net asset value could be kind of jumpy the last day. So what they do is they calculate an average over the whole year or an entire quarter, smooths things out. Okay, so it's the lesser of annual purchases or sales divided by average net asset value. So an example would be a mutual fund sold $63 million in stocks and bonds and purchased $57 million in stocks and bonds during the year. The fund's average NAV was $130 million. What was the fund's turnover? Well, what's lesser, 63 or 57? It's 57 divided by 130 is 0.438, 43.8%. Now, how do we interpret that? Well, what it's kind of saying is, in general, it's saying, you know, the 43% or about 44% of the portfolio you started out with at the beginning is turned over and is gone and been replaced by their securities. So 43% is gone. So this turnover is an important indicator of how active your portfolio is and how much trading costs are being incurred, the trading costs that are hard to see. So your turnover is, is, is vital. Now, if you are a passively managed fund that's mimicking the S&P or the Dow, your turnover is going to be very low. And if you're highly active, darting in and out every day in a whole bunch of stocks, turnover could be over 100%. 
you know, if it's 200%, that means that the portfolio you started with has been turned over twice in total. Okay, let's look at share classes. Share classes are important. And the reason they're important is because they tell you either directly or indirectly what the expenses you're going to be paying for the fund is. So it's very common to see class A, B, or C shares of a fund. And that's just generic. There are, oh, the, the whole alphabet. You could have F shares, S shares, V shares. They could be called, you know, if you look at Vanguard, Vanguard calls some of their shares Admiral shares. All different names. So, but generically, there, there has been a history where funds charge A, B, and C, or they have classes A, B, and C, and those class, classes signify the types of expenses that are charged by a fund. Now, I'll give you a little warning. I may have class A, B, and C shares here, and I'm going to give you really rough guidelines on how it works, but you really need to read the prospectus because the world is all over the place. The, the investment company world is all over the place here in terms of share classes and the expenses that are associated with it because there's no real guideline that says, you know, you can only charge certain expenses in a certain share class. Like I said, you can create any share class you want, and some funds have like a half a dozen or more share classes. So let's look at the an example of what an A, B, and C would could represent, and uh, don't memorize what I'm telling you here. So Class A usually, usually carries significant front end loads, which, as I said, can go all the way up to 5.75%. And there could be volume discounts associated with it with various breakpoints. What that means is, you know, if you spend over $1,000, maybe it's a little less of a, a load. If you spend over 10000 even lower, and so on. So it's a sliding scale. That's volume discounts. Now, Class B generally doesn't have a front-end load. And they may or may not offer volume discounts. Instead, investors pay high 12B1 fees in general which could really hurt you over the long run. So if you look at this, you compare A and B, if you have a long horizon to invest in, you probably want to go with A and get dinged once with the front end load. And then, you know, if you have a very short horizon, maybe you don't want to pay a 5% load uh, to get in. Maybe you just want to hold the securities for one year, the, the shares for one year, and you just get hit with a 1% 12B1 fee. That would make more sense. So already you see in, in the analysis here, those fees and that are associated with particular classes are signaling what shares you should buy. Now, Class C usually doesn't carry front-end loads uh, or offer volume discounts. So you may get a 12B1 fee in the middle there. There could be, in fact, deferred contingent sales charges may actually involved in all may be involved in all classes so you're going to have some kind of mixture of fees i mean funds charge fees they incur expenses but some of them are pretty uh, inefficient and charge relatively high expenses and those are the ones you want to avoid so my point is share classes signify the fee structure that you're going to pay and your horizon is really the key component to your decision on whether or not to buy class A, B, or C, because if you have a long horizon, you want to avoid the recurring high expenses and pay the one-time big front end load if you can. Now, let's talk about expense ratios. Okay, an expense ratio. That equals annual operating expenses divided by average net asset value. And the average net assets for the period that you're looking at. So it's almost always expressed annually, unless it tells you otherwise, and it's footnoted carefully, but it's going to be annual operating expenses. So this does not include loads and, and usually doesn't include account fees that may, you may get hit with. It doesn't include back end loads, the, the deferred contingent sales charges. It's the operating expenses of the fund. 
divided by the average net assets. So it's annual, just like you know how interest rates are almost always on an annual basis. So you look at bond yields, even if the bond yield is for a three month treasury security, it's on an annual basis, it's been annualized for comparative purposes. The same thing goes here. Expense ratios are almost always disclosed on an annual basis, so you can compare one fund to the next. Otherwise, you know, fund A would give you an expense ratio for a week, and you'd be like, wow, that's really a low expense ratio. I should buy this fund. And another one would give you an expense ratio for 15 months. It wouldn't make any sense, so it's standardized. Let's look at an example from my notes. So last year, American funds incurred $475,000 in operating expenses, that excluded 12B1 fees, and the 12B1 fees were $100,000. The average net assets for the year were $45 million. What was the fund's expense ratio? Well, it's 475 plus 100, just chop the zeros off, 45,000, which is 45 million, and that comes out to be, oops, equal to 0.01, oh, oh. 0.01278, you know, about 1.3% approximately, which is high, as I've talked about before. Expense ratio should be somewhere between 0.1 and 0.5%. Okay, let's look at another example. Suppose you invest in Pillsbury Mutual Fund for one year and then decide to redeem your shares to buy a car. The fund charged 3% front-end load, 2% back-end load, and has an expense ratio of 1.25%. What was your total expenses as a percentage of your investment? Assume the net asset value remained unchanged during the year. Well, you basically were charged 3% to get in, plus 2% to get out, plus 1.25%. So approximately, you're paying 6.25%. You would never want to do this. First of all, you'd never want to invest in a fund that has such a high expense ratio. And then you want to avoid front-end loads. And then you probably can't help but pay a back-end load. But here's the point. <clears throat> Even besides all that, you wouldn't want to invest in a fund like this because you have this 2% back-end load. If you have a one-year horizon, you know, you put your money in an account and you expect to to buy a car later on, you don't want to put it in a mutual fund, let it sit for one year uh, for a couple of reasons. One, you could have a big capital loss if the market drops. And two, you're going to get hit with some type of expenses that you really don't want to get hit with. So your, your optimal choice, your best choice in the situation is to put your money in a money market fund. Money market funds don't have loads, back end or front end loads, because they're designed to be to, to mimic checking accounts. And so you can basically write checks against them and and you have a limited number of checks. Now you can't write a whole lot of checks. And there'll be limits, maybe a half a dozen per month or less. And then the checks need to be, say, a minimum of $250 or more. I mean, you have to read the prospectus and the details. But the point being, you can use money market funds instead of a fund like this, which just is gonna rake you through the coals with expenses. Now, let's look at another example. Assume the following information on the ABC fund as of the end of the year. Assume 5 million in assets, 1.5 million in liabilities, 60,000 shares outstanding. Expenses were 120,000 for the year. What is the net asset value of the fund at the end of the year? Okay, five. So you know the net asset value per share is going to be the market value of assets minus the liabilities divided by the number of shares. And this is five, right? Five million minus 1.5 million in liabilities. Let's write it all out because it's only 60,000 in shares. Divided by 60,000 shares. Okay. That turns out to be 58.33, $58.33. Now the question is, what, what do I do with that $120,000 in, in expenses? You know, should I, should I put it in this calculation? And the answer is no, because those expenses are either reflected in this $5 million. In other words, the assets have been reduced if you actually paid cash for the expenses. 
And then if you didn't pay cash for the expenses, they're a liability, and so they're included here. Either way, it reduced the $5 million or it increased this $1.5 million for that $120,000 of expenses. So you ignore it, and your net asset value is $58.33 per share. Now, let's move on to a slightly more complicated fund question that has to do with closed-end funds. Now, just a little bit of background on closed-end funds. They're almost like a regular mutual fund, except closed-end funds operate a little bit differently. Um, closed-end funds, you buy the shares, and they ch you, you buy them through your broker like you would buy stock, which is a little bit different than a regular mutual fund because when you buy into a regular mutual fund, you send the fund your money. You give them your money, and they buy the shares for you. You often deal directly with the fund. And so you don't have a... You, you don't pay a brokerage commission. You're not pay, using a broker. You're going directly to the, the investment company. With closed-end funds, they trade like stock. So you buy a portfolio. So you can buy and sell closed-end funds all day. And so what's interesting about the closed-end funds is they have a net asset value that's computed every single day. They take the assets of the portfolio minus the liabilities and divide it by the number of shares. That's the NAV. The share price that trades all day during the day should be really, really close to that net asset value. Because if it's not, it's telling you for some reason people are pricing those shares differently than what they're actually worth. That's an interesting problem. It shows up in the real world on the, for closed-end funds, but I don't want to get into that. What I want to say here is that, look, sometimes closed-end funds can trade at premiums or discounts. And so that premium or discount is reflected, gets reflected in the offering price that you end up having to pay. So let's do a calculation. Let's do an example. Suppose you purchase shares of a closed-end fund that it's initial, uh, at its initial IPO, initial public offering. So this closed-end fund is starting up from scratch, brand new. It's going to sell shares for $28. That's the offering price right now. The prospectus indicates that the fund's promoter gets an 8% load sales charge from the offering. Whew, high. The next day, the fund sh shares are trading at a 12% discount from NAV. So for some reason, the market's looking at these shares, even though they're actually worth a, a certain amount, they're being discounted by 12%, which is a little unusual for it to happen that fast. But work with me here. It's just an example. What is the value of your investment? And then can you figure out the total return? Okay, let's look at it. Well, the offering price equals the NAV, remember, divided by 1 minus the load. Okay. And so we, we, the question is asking, what is the value of your investment? Well, we pay, the offering price was 28. There was an 8% load. And NAV, if you recall, is exactly what gets invested. So... Um, remember, we did an example where the offering price was $10, and what got invested? $9.79 because 3% got skimmed off the top. So now we're asking, so this is what, what got invested. Now we're asking what got invested here? What was invested here? Well, if you, if you do the calculation, the NAV is equal to... 25.76, and now if it trades at a 12% discount, it trades at 88% of its value, then it's trading at 22.67. So you bought some shares at $28. The promoter skimmed 8% off for a load, and then you ended up with a 12% discount because the market said, look, yeah, you know, I don't really like the value of that. It's, I don't think it's really worth it. And so they discounted at 12%, and now you have an your the value of what you have is only 2267. So what's your return? Well, you ended up with 2267 minus the 28 you paid divided by the 28 you paid and you get minus 0.1903 or 19% negative. Whew. For one day. It's just an exaggerated example. So uh, not realistic that it's that bad. But be careful. The next problem this is an interesting one. I put this once on a quiz and nobody could figure out what I was talking about. 
It was pretty obvious to me, but you be the judge of it here. 27 months ago, you purchased 364.18 shares of a mutual fund. Okay, You can buy fractional shares. So 364.18 shares of a mutual fund. Since then, you have reinvested the fund's dividends and acquired an additional 41.89 shares. So when you buy a fund, you can check a little box that says reinvest the dividends automatically in the new shares or pay me cash, in which case they'll put it in some cash account for you. So here we assume that you've checked the box and dividends get automatically reinvested for you. So now it says the fund currently has an NAV of $26.24, $26.24. The fund charges a de contingent deferred sales charge of 6% for the first two years, and then it declines by 1% a year and then permanently ceases. So once it goes down far enough, you go out far enough in time, you don't have any back-end load. How much money will you receive if you redeem all your shares today? Okay, the first thing you got to do is do a timeline to get your head on straight with this so we, so we don't get lost in the numbers. So it's telling you, oh, there's a back-end load of 6% for the first two years, and then the next time period it's 5%, and then it's 4%, and then it just keeps dropping as time goes on. 27 months is right here, which implies you're going to have a deferred, because it's 27 months later, contingent, and it's contingent on you redeeming your shares, and it's also contingent on when you redeem your shares, sales charge. Okay, so now let's figure out how much money you get, because how much money will you receive if you redeem all your shares today? Well, let's say we got 364 point. 1.8 shares plus 41.89. That's how many shares we have today. The shares are worth 26.24 according to the problem, which is 10,655.08. Now we have to apply the 5%. We have to chop 5% off this, which means we're left with 95%. And we end up with 10,122.51. Okay, so that's how a sliding scale def deferred contingent sales charge operates. Okay, now one more note at the end here of the video is, you know, when you look at mutual funds, look at the prospectus. They are companies. That's why they're called companies. They have a balance sheet and an income statement, as I said earlier. And there's lots of disclosure requirements that the Securities and Exchange Commission has on it. You, we could spend several lectures just looking at the disclosure requirements. Some of them would be pretty interesting, but the, the funds generally will have a graph of a $10,000, hypothetical $10,000 investment, and what it would look like graphically over 10 years. So the graphs look like this. They start off, here's $10,000. And, you know, the fund could do, have done this. And so this is a 10-year period. So this is year zero all the way up to year 10. And so that graph will give you an indication of what happened to your portfolio. Now, I was kind of generous with this portfolio because I, I didn't do this. Some portfolios, you know, you buy into them, you lose money, but they eventually recover. So the point is you'll see these graphs with a hypothetical $10,000 investment and you'll see what the portfolio looks like. And in some cases, what they'll do is what they'll do is they'll assume a five percent hypothetical total return, and they do that for comparative purposes. Every fund has to do the same type of scenario, so that you can compare one a set of graphs to another and some numbers, the numbers, the ending values from one fund to the next, to see how it went. So consistency is really important in the financial world because it's so easily, so easy to get distracted and to get confused about the time periods that are involved in a lot of these calculations and it can be very misleading. So consistency is important.